Uh, minutes. All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and start. Uh, I don't know too many people here, but um, it's okay. Uh, yeah, it might be a little bit light today too. I have, I have a few more things I wanna cover about logistic regression. Um, let me start the, let's see. Um, I, we, we covered pretty well stuff in the assignment three. Uh, let me bring that back up again real quick. Um, so, So then I'm, let me just kind of open up. Maybe I'll open it up again at the end once maybe some more people trickle in. Is uh, anybody uh, been working on the assignment? Have any questions that they want to uh, want me to clarify or maybe discuss a little bit? Now you've had a chance to work on it, look at it in some more detail. And somebody asked about um, when I'm. Remember if I mentioned this last time or not? Um, uh, I was having problems from setting the style, which on the one hand, it's not really a big deal, but on the other, you know, I, again, I encourage you to check your versions. You might want to try to make certain you're using the uh, same version. So yeah, if, if you're getting an error trying to set the uh, seaboard style, when you do that, you probably don't have the same version I'm using for the grading and the reference stuff for these, but probably again yeah, like it's okay but if you want to be certain you, know, you want, might want to try and update your versions or use the virtual environment that i provide or something um i'm still looking for these by friday so so i have a little bit more time to work on on these so somebody did ask about uh, you should be using this learning curves function to plot all the learning curves so i, I don't know why you'd use something else so you need for every one of parts two, three, four, and five, you should have plot at least one set of learning curves. Like, uh, feel free to do more. So one thing I mentioned last time, something that a good student might want to do, especially for part four and five, um, is demonstrate your exploration of some of the alpha values. So you might want to do it more than once. Um, where you show some alphas that are too small, so you're underfitting, and some, some that are too big, so you're still overfitting, and kind of how you zero in to something that was you know, just right, to the three little bears. And then you don't want it to be underfit, you don't want it to be overfit, you want it to be just right alpha. They give us a good you know, uh, score on there. So, but but uh, but yeah, you should be showing me the learning curves as well. So the way that you demonstrate uh, a particular value of alpha is good is. I look at the learning curves and it looks like it's converging, not diverging. And it looks like it's converging to a, a root mean squared error overall cost that's similar to an overfit uh, performance. And so it's, it's, not, it's not obviously underfit. All right, no questions. Like I said, I might give one more chance at the end here. Although it might be a little bit short today, we'll see. I don't have a whole lot. Um, so yeah, with those, uh, we will, and I uh, haven't completed setting up the test yet. I'll talk more about it probably Tuesday. I'm not certain if we'll meet on Thursday or not. So heads up for you guys that are here. It is gonna be a time test. Um, I'm, I'm debating, I might, I was thinking about just opening it up for like our normal Thursday class period. Uh, I may or may not do that because it is supposed to be, you know, face to face class. So even though I'm thinking about doing it online, but uh, but having it uh, constrained a bit of that. So uh, I might do that. I might open it up a little bit longer, but it might only be opened up for like Thursday. So I might, another thing I might do is, is, is 
uh, keep our Thursday class, see if anybody has any last minute questions on stuff and kind of open it up after class for a couple of hours. For the table, so. um, but I am probably targeting to have it on Thursday mostly. Um, so be prepared. So you, to prepare for it, uh, it's it's going to be uh, pretty much the stuff you did on assignment one, two, three. We'll look over those assignments, including what. So I, yeah, I'm going to try and get the assignment threes back so we can talk about those on Tuesday, since uh, since you might have a polynomial and a regression as well. So so yeah, definitely I might be grading those pretty early. So make sure you do get those submitted on time, certainly before Saturday morning. Uh, but yeah, so reviewing those, uh, the, since it's going to be timed, uh, I'll probably give you questions that are pretty much similar to what you should have already done, uh, but kind of the most basic forms of them. So on the assumption that you've already done that stuff, I just want you to demonstrate it again for test questions. So just a heads up, or that's basically where I'm at right now. So. All right, but uh, but yeah, we, we, we'll, I'm planning on getting more information on that on Tuesday. Um, and I'm planning on kind of thoroughly maybe discussion, discussing results of assignment three. So I'll definitely try to make certain that we have those all returned back so we can talk about the third assignment on Tuesday. Um, all right. Um, oh, uh, Another thing while I'm thinking about it, uh, let me kind of remind you that um, besides kind of these lecture notebooks from the hands-on machine learning, um, I do recommend um, looking at uh, Dr. Ng's linear and logistic regression. Um, I think he does a better job than I do, than most people do, on, uh, especially if you're really interested in getting into uh, understanding a little bit better how um, the cost functions work and, and how gradient descent works and stuff like that. So, um, but uh, those those lecture videos under Ng, they, there should be links to his original class. It's already, uh, might be 10 years old now at this point or around that, but, but they're still pretty good. So, but he goes through similar kinds of stuff, but if you are looking for strengthening your understanding of the linear and the logistic regression, um, um, check those out. Um, oh, another thing um, I did just find, I did just push this morning or actually just two hours ago, a fix. Uh, so I guess I didn't run it on Tuesday, but um, uh, the, uh, the, the logistic regression lecture notebook uh, actually wasn't running, at least in my most recent version. So uh, uh, in my reference version of the um, uh, environment. So no, no, mentioned that. Um, so do, do let me know if you are, especially if you're running, whether you're running the same version or not of mine, uh, if, if you try and run these lecture notebooks and you try and run the whole thing from top to bottom and it doesn't run for you, I mean, I do, I would appreciate you letting me know that, that I want them all to run in the most recent version of in the version that we're using for the class. Um, uh, but yeah, I also want to make it easier for people to, to be running these and, 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 you know, changing stuff and doing stuff by hand so that uh, they have at least a starting point uh, where the stuff runs. So uh, for this one, for some reason, uh, we were using, um, um, so I did push out some changes on there, but um uh, or was it so the 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 plot of the arrow something's changed so we had to modify that slightly to get that plot to work and um this uh i guess np i guess the np.int type has been removed from numpy so, so but you get the same function functionality just using the built-in int type if you uh, change the y labels to an in integer um, instead of a boolean here so I don't know if that's strictly necessary to do, but but yeah, that that statement wasn't working um, uh, in my most recent versions of NumPy. Um, those, those are the only two things I think that I had to fix to get this notebook to run. But you know, in in the future, you know, do run those and and let me know. Uh, maybe try and run those if, if they don't run every cell 
uh, so I can figure out if if it's your version or if it's something that really needs to be fixed on these for the versions that I'm trying to get them all to be compatible with so people can run them with the reference version stuff. Um, all right, so, you know, we had, uh, I don't know if I have a whole lot more to say. I'd, um, we, we've pretty much gone through most of all the logistic regression stuff last time, you know, how useful or helpful it was for people, uh, including down to here talking about the decision boundaries, you know. So this, this stuff is, is directly from the hands-on machine learning textbook. They have the same example in there. Um, but, you know, make certain that, uh, uh, that you do understand what we're doing here and the basic, you know, the, the basic concept of decision boundaries. Uh, so everything that, that's a supervised learning classifier, that's what it's doing. I mean, it is going to be building a model that if you, if you could visualize it, would end up being a decision boundary uh, that like in a binary classification has separates things that's going to make predictions of as uh, false versus things of uh, true, right? Um, uh, another thing about this is that this does uh, demonstrate, uh, I maybe didn't emphasize it a lot, but it does demonstrate that logistic regression, the, the function that we talked about, it really is a linear function still. So the resulting decision boundary is a line when you plot it on two dimensions, and it'll be a, a, a flat plane uh, if it was a higher dimensional decision boundary that you're creating, right? So um the the next thing we're going to be doing after the test we're going to be starting talking about things like um support vector machines and decision trees they are capable of making nonlinear uh decision uh, creating nonlinear models and, it, and actually the polynomial regression that we looked at was also nonlinear but we were kind of doing that by hand so we were building a nonlinear model and fitting the best polynomial to a um to some set of data, um, but uh, but yeah, some of the the upcoming supervised machine learning methods that we look at for classification, they inherently can uh, create nonlinear uh, models. You'll see what that means, but that makes them more powerful. So, for example, uh, with the, just these two features, there is no linear decision boundary that will give that will perfectly separate the data that we have here. So um, that may or may not be an issue. Uh, because of, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about overfitting and underfitting. Um, but, um, but yeah, when you have more than two uh, features, you know, when you have a much higher dimensional space, you normally do have to have something, um, uh, if you want to get the best performance, that is giving you a more complex decision boundary that it creates for the model to separate your classes. Um, all right. So I thought I would say we didn't talk about the very last part here. Um, we will probably come back and see softmax the, the, the softmax regression here. So it's good to understand this function. Um, although in this class we'll mostly end up just using it. So so we might. Uh, you'll see some other examples where we say we want to build a classifier. We say use the softmax function instead of the regular logistic or something else. Like that. So, um, so we've mentioned before. I mean, what what you learn about uh, logistic regression here? Uh, we could build a multi-class classifier using the same method that we've already talked about. So uh, one method is we can use the function that we looked at on Tuesday and build uh, like, so if we want to classify all three classes of, of uh, so this um, um, Iris data set actually has, it's a multi-class. It has uh, three classes, Virginica, Versicolor, and Satosa. So we, we, we really want a model, we want to do the full thing that gives me 0, 1, 2, or 1, 2, 3, whatever label we can use for our three classes here. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, we could do a 1 versus many or a 1 versus 1. So uh, we could build separate um, logistic regression classifiers to 
back, you know, to, to build one like Virginica versus not Virginica and Satosa versus not Satosa. And then there's a, we didn't talk about it a lot, but there's a pretty easy way to combine that. So from the three classifiers to figure out what your final answer is going to be. Um, but another approach that, that's used for classifications, the softmax function is used a lot now. Um, it allows us to directly build for some uh, machine learning algorithms to, to directly build a multi-class classifier, right? So instead of having separate models, we just train one model. And we're really just training one model on a, a variation of the function that we looked at last time, right? Um, but in general, it's, it's good to kind of understand some of the basics. And oh, that was actually the, the main thing I did for the new version that I just pushed uh, this morning is I, I added some examples here. So you might not have these if you haven't done a poll, a, a poll of Git repository um, of what I'm about ready to talk about here. So, um, so, um, so actually, I do have to take that back a little bit. So what normally happens when we're using softmax, at least for logistic regression, is you're going to end up building, you're going to have end up, you know, if I have K classes, so for, it's always helpful to me to make these concrete. So talking about the Irish data set, K is three here. We've, we've got a multi-class problem with three classes, Satosa, so Virginica, and the uh, third one. <laughs> um, so K is three here. So what, what we can do with the softmax is I, I still need three different sets of beta parameters. So I need a model that takes an input X, but has a different set of theta for class one. Let's say that's Satosa. Um, so, so that this notation here is meant to represent that I've actually got three separate sets of parameters now that I'm going to have to optimize and, and find here, right? But given those, um, I can come up, uh, our textbook calls this uh, a score function, right? So uh, for every uh, input, I can get three scores. So it's score for whether it's, you know, how much I think it's progenica by taking the input times the theta for my uh, first class. I get a second score for how much I think it's uh, Satosa. Um, and, and a third one for how much I think it's the uh, uh, VersaColor. One of the three things I they add. Um, so that's all the S is here, right? So it's just a number of, of after doing. So, but again, this should, this should be familiar. This, this is just a linear transformation here. So given an input, that notation means we take the input and we do a matrix multiplication. So because of the matrix multiplication, we, we multiply each corresponding input feature to the parameter for that feature, right? So we're just doing a simple multiplication, then we sum those together. Uh, that's what the matrix multiplication, that, that's what this notation does here. That, that, that is gonna be a simple linear transformation uh, of the, the data into a single value. Um, and, and, but yeah, in this case, we got three, we got one for each of our classes in the multi-class um, problem here. So um, what the softmax does, what, the way I think of the softmax is what we want to do is th those three numbers that, that we end up with the linear transformation can be some just arbitrary value. It would be like 10, 100, and negative 25 for the three results that we get um for um uh, doing that transformation so what we would like to do is change that into some sort of a, a, a good um, probability distribution and by that i mean we would like it that it represents the our confidence or what we think of as the probability that it is each of those three classes so and normally the bigger the number uh the higher its probability should be and the smaller the number the lower its probability should be. So a large negative number should have a very small probability and a large positive number should have a big one. But it's gonna be relative to each other. And this, this should make more sense when you look at the example that I created. Uh, but, um, you know, again, this 
you know, we're doing some notation here um, and we're reusing that notation that we use for the signaling function. But here we're using this for this uh, softmax function. So by doing the softmax, this is the softmax function now. Uh, so we take those scores and put it to the softmax function. So the softmax is we take the exponential of the scores uh, and then we're going to divide those by the sum of those scores, each one. Um, and what that does um, um, is that has the property of changing all the scores to values between zero and one, and that the sum of the scores will sum up to one. So it's a proper probability distribution when you apply the softmax function, all right? So um, um, let me just mention, maybe I should put this first here. So if, if, if you don't know what we mean by the exponential function, um, it's really just, um, in fact, there is a exp function, uh, but it's 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 really just um, um, taking uh, the the constant e e is Euler's constant, which you know um, you can um, find out what that is from the NumPy library. So. Uh, famous constant uh, it pops up in lots of different places. But all we're doing for the exponential function is we're taking that and raising it to some power. Like, uh, so uh, say, say exponential negative five is taking E, you know, that constant, which it's a, a irrational number. So it actually has infinitely number of digits there. But, um, uh, but taking the exponential negative five is just taking that, raising it to that power, right? Um, but but yeah, I mean, since this is a, uh, a since e Euler's number is a is, is you know somewhere between two and three, uh, the result is always going to be uh, some number greater than zero. Um, although, right, if you make it really really small, it'll get really close to zero. Um, but um, the other property of it is that it, it's exponential. So that the the name. But what it means by that, by the name, is anytime the, you know, the, the value is in the exponent, it's going to grow really fast. So uh, exponential functions look like this, right? So if I plot the exponential function from negative 10 to 10, uh, it looks like mostly zero for a while, and then all of a sudden explodes, right? So it gets really big, right? But another thing I think that students sometimes don't appreciate is, I mean, it, it always looks like that. So whatever range you look at, so if I look at it from like negative one to zero, um, it's still, so you don't quite see it explode as fast, but it's, it's really still exponential even within that range, right? So it's, it's growing much faster as you keep getting bigger and bigger, okay? Try from negative one to one, so. Um, anyway, I mean, that, that's all we're doing with uh, this here is we're, whatever those scores are, we're putting it in the exponential function, right? Uh, and then all we're doing down here is we sum up. Like if I so if I have three scores, I sum up their values and I divide them. So the result of that is every every uh, value has to end up being a value between zero and one, right? So something again, um, an example to me makes this hopefully straightforward, right? So let's say uh, here each row is supposed to represent a different set of scores, right? So I've already got some data parameters. And I've calculated the scores. So like the first row represents the scores for my first input. So I just ended up with like a negative 2.5 that it's Hosa, uh, 4.5 that is Virginica, and 5.7 is Versicon, or whatever the three columns are. So those are just my three scores. Right? So if I take the exponential of those, I mean, all I'm doing is taking e to the, the power of that, right? So that's what... Um, uh, that's what these are. So these are going to be the exponential. So the exponential of five, so e to the 5.7 is 298. So then to, to softmax these, basically, I can turn this into a probability distribution by, if I, if I sum up the three scores and I, and I divide by that sum, uh, so you should, should be able to see that no value, I mean, if, if, if both of these were zero, um, and I can pretty much essentially make these zero. So to illustrate what I'm talking about, if both of these are really small.
So when we do that, they're, they're both going to be essentially zero, right? But when I sum them up, um, uh, so the sum is going to be 298.86 plus things that are essentially zero. So that, that's the sum of the three scores. And then I'm going to divide by that. So in that case, you know, anything that's close to zero is just going to be zero, right? Anything that's close to the sum of those is going to be close to one, right? So, so you should be able to see that everything ends up with a value between zero and one. You can never get, I can never have something that ends up being bigger than, than the sum of these things. So, so everything has to be one or less. And since, because of the exponential, everything is going to be, you know, non-negative, it's going to be zero or negative, or close to zero, if it's really, really negative. Um, at the low end, it has to be zero, close to zero. Uh, and then, so by summing these up, so all we're doing here um, is we're summing up each row, right? So by adding the axis in here to the sum, we, we sum up uh, this row here, which is essentially 298.8. Right? And uh, we get another sum here. So these sums that we print out, um, that's the sum of the first scores for the first uh, inputs. That's the sum of the second scores. So, so the second sum was 342 and 30. All right, so the sums can be different, but once we put it to the soft max, so if we divide these three values by their sum, we get 0, 0, 1. Right? So that's all the sum. Max. So, so um, if we divide um, yeah, these three values by uh, the 342, we get another one. This one's pretty close to one, the other is easy. Right? Uh, the other property of that, though, is since we're dividing by the sum, um, uh, these softmaxed values are going to sum up to one, right? So if I sum up these three values, they're one. If I sum up these three values, it's one. And if I sum up these three, so my, my last example, they were all, it was kind of uncertain. So they all end up getting relatively close scores when, when you multiply the kind of theta, whatever the thetas were that we had here, right? Um, so since they were all close, um, uh, we ended up with exponentials that were pretty close. So we end up with probabilities that are all around 0 0.3, 0 0.5. Um, so, um, yeah, so I mean, you know, I find people sometimes think of this as kind of mysterious, but that's what we're doing. This has, um, you know, um, some advantages now. Uh, so the big one being, since it's a proper probability distribution, we can interpret that in particular ways. We can use this in a particular nice way, right? So, um, but, but yeah, the, the normal way that people interpret that is as how confident you are. So how, so we think it's 96% probable that it's class one. There's only like a 3% probability that it's class two. So you can kind of think of it like that when you're doing a softmax for a multi-class uh, classification task. Um, anyway, so that's that's kind of what that uh, the, the P hat here is. is This is really the uh, cost function that we're going to be using now instead of the one we did Tuesday. Um, and so it's it's putting it through this softmax uh, transformation. So we're taking the scores like we had before, which is really just the inputs times the thetas, uh, and we put it through that. So the result will be for every input, we're not going to have three scores um, that are between zero and one, and the sum of the three scores sums up to one. All right, for for a when we have k is three classes. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, this is from the textbook. Oh, it, um, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but um, this always bugged me. I just uh, noticed it again. So uh, I really like this textbook, except for for one thing. I don't know why they've got really bad typesetting for their mathematical notation. So it'd be really hard sometimes to uh, to see what they're doing here. They they're using like ASCII notation instead of, so I think that's supposed to be, this is the function I think we're looking at, but that's supposed to be like P hat and things like that. So um, uh, this function kind of here. Um, so one thing I want to point out though is, yeah, if you read this section, although it might be tough to see from your textbook copy looks the same as mine to see, 
uh, the notation they have there, but um, um, uh, but but yeah, this represents the cost function where we're using the, the softmax here. Um, but um, uh, a thing I'll point out here is that this, if you if you think about it, if you squint hard enough, if k is two, if I'm back to a binary classification task, this actually uh, ends up being equivalent to um, the the original the, the one that we looked at uh, last time, right? So here, you know, we we only had uh, y label was zero one, right? And when when it was zero, this drops out. We just had that term. When it was one, this drops out. We had that term there. Um, this is really equivalent the cost function here when k is two. Uh, it's just that now our labels are going to be like um, one and two or zero and one. Um, uh, but uh, uh, actually, that's not true. So uh, one difference here is not like k is two. Uh, we would have to have um, two labels now. Um, so like uh, uh, for our, our, let's say our I input, we have to have label one or true and label two. I can for false. So, so if the true label is true, this would be 1.9. Instead of having one label, we're doing it with this notation, we'd have two, but we end up with the equivalent thing. If the true label is one, so when k is one, uh, we're only using that one, and the other one's going to be zero, and it'll drop off for the other one when you sum up to do the cost. So, yeah, hopefully, you're, you're, you're kind of I'm getting the gist of what I'm doing here, but um, 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 but yeah, I mean that's uh, a useful thing to realize. Is this really is equivalent to what we talked about before? Um, slightly different, and so so you know, now we've got two labels instead of one, uh, but you'll get the same cost function in this case um, that we talked about. But of course, we can more easily extend this now to three, four, however many labels, however many labels K is in a principled way. Uh, because well, I mean it's equivalent because we're taking the log of that that score there um, after putting it through the softmax. So, um, anyway, because that's equivalent, you actually can also write relatively easily figure out the gradients, the derivative. So you can also apply gradient des descent uh, on this. So. Um, anyway, so the um, um, what that comes down to then is uh, this is discussed here, but in practice, if you want to use the softmax for the logistic regression in scikit-learn, uh, the way you do it is um, um, you specify uh, a particular parameter for the multi-class, right? So the default is to actually use um, uh, like a one versus many, um, I think it's described here, or one versus all. Um, so, Uh, let me bring this documentation up here after rerunning. Um, um, so the default what is uh, is auto, which um, where is it? Um, so I, yeah, it's a, I, I guess usually it will use the one versus the rest, um, um, but uh, but yeah, you can force it to use the multinomial, uh, which uh, effectively is going to end up using the softmax here. Although um, also as the textbook discusses, um, um, you do have to use not all solvers will work with the soft the softmax in this context here. So um, it is also necessary to. 
um, uh, to specify, I guess, the LB FGS solver in this case. Um, also, you know, this is another thing that you ought to understand better now. Uh, by default, um, logistic regression is going to be adding a little bit of regularization in there. All right, so, so it actually adds in uh, some L2 regularization. Um, So, um, but, but yeah, so since C by default, oh, that ends up corresponding to the alpha, right? So notice though, that sometimes these, these parameters change names in different contexts. So, but that really is gonna be um, uh, the amount um, of regularization. Although this is something we will talk about, we'll, we'll get back to this, you know, we really have to understand this right now, but it, it actually ends up being one minus alpha in this context, again, for kind of, strange reasons. So, um, so anyway. Um, okay, so doing that though, um, this will actually use the softmax function. So this is again from the textbook. So if we wanted to create the, the a logistic regression using this alternative way, doing the multi-class classification, we have to change a few things, but that would end up doing it for us. Um, um, I didn't. I didn't discuss. Um, so you know, you should should kind of understand this. Then you know. So once you do this softmax function. When you make your final decision, of course, um, it's relatively simple. So our, all that argmax means is that um, um, if you look at the scores, if, if you're asked to pick which class, I pick the one that has the highest probability among the three there, right? So among these three, I'd pick that one since it's highest among, so argmax is just the, which class is the highest um, among the ones for that input. Um, um, So that means, um, but but yeah, kind of a nice thing. So you, you can kind of tell that you are using softmax in the logistic regression because if you use the prob A, that returns the raw scores before it does the argmax or does the threshold. So in general, that's what scikit-learn does. Predict, just give you the final prediction using whatever it does to, to like a threshold. Um, or for the for softmax case, it's, it's using that argmax to figure out. Um, and prob A, though, will give you kind of the raw scores for things. So in this case, for multi-class, we're going to have one for each. Um, so we can approximately see that it thinks. Um, so the, 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 the labels must be like 0, 1, and 2 um, for our data here. Um, but yeah, so for class 2, um, up to 94% with the other 5% mostly for the class 1, is what it would predict here. Um, and that should make sense, like, for example, if you look at the uh, the figure, right? So uh, the, the first value is five. So our first feature, um, that should have been our pedal length. So it's five around over here, but uh, only about two uh, at the, the pedal width, right? So we end up somewhere around here, right? So it's going to be predicting um, uh, mostly that's Irish progenica, but it might think I'm, I'm close enough to the border that it thinks it's the versicolor. It thinks it's a pretty low probability that's the one way over here. Right? And that's uh, why those numbers are going to be uh, what you're getting. Right? The further away you got from this boundary, the bigger it would have been for that one, and the other two would have been zero or closer to zero. Um, all right, so yeah, so this is another example of plotting the decision boundary. So notice another thing, um, so we're finally doing a full uh, multi-class. Um, uh, we do use the contour plots. Um, 
so roughly anywhere, but but um, uh, um, you can see though, for example, it's it's still a linear decision boundary, so there really do end up being lines between uh, the different regions that it cuts out to make the the decisions for the three classes. So that's that's one thing. Um, in this case, it would be much tougher to analytically figure out the decision boundary like we did on the previous one, but using the contour plot, you can you can see where that uh, decision boundary ends up happening uh, for these uh, data sets here. Um, <laughs> all right, so we still got plenty of time, uh, but uh, yeah, that's that was kind of all the extra stuff I want to talk about. Um, so um, let me go back to this one more time. Um, so let me know um, if you guys are working on assignment three, if you have any questions on that. Um, I'll be happy to, if anybody wants to clarify anything about this. Otherwise, yeah, I mean, no, I'm not going to hold you guys around. I, since we're early, I can stick around here. If you want to ask it like in person, face to face, we, we still do have kind of like 30 minutes or so usual, but um, yep. All right. So yeah, I have nothing else. So I'll go ahead and just end there. And then go. Um, I'll stick around, um, but uh, I'll see you guys next week and we'll get into the test too then. Okay.